Hamid Anwar from AIT. And today we are going to talk about another important building block of structural engineering. In fact, one of the basic blocks, which is the materials, understanding of the structural materials. And as you can as you can see, every structure is built by using some material, uh, whether it be it's concrete or steel or masonry or wood or aluminum or any other material that we can create. Understanding the material response is the key to understanding the cross-section response, which then in turn is the key to understanding the member response and which then helps us to understand the entire structural response. So that's why it is very essential that we start with a clear understanding of the materials uh, and their structural properties and how these properties can be computed, how they can be used effectively and uh, you know, what do they depend on and what is the, the properties that we need for a certain task. And that is the focus of this discussion and, and we will find that the basic materials, for example, the, the concrete or steel, even when we want to do the detailed analysis, we need a lot more information about them than just the modulus of elasticity. So let's look into the materials and, and hope that we learn something new. Let's start the discussion on the material and how we can understand the properties of the material uh, for structural design as well as analysis. So this discussion we will do in several parts and today is the first part which is the overview and the introduction. Any discussion on the material should start from the overall understanding of the structural system. And as you know, a structural system is basically composed of its members and the members are composed of cross sections and cross sections are made of materials. And this is the starting point of our discussion today how we can understand the materials very well, so we can understand the cross-section behavior and member behavior, and finally the structure response. What do we want to know about the materials? First of all, the important thing is that we should look at what is that the people would like to know about any material in general. So general interest, what a material is, is does it have a good texture? Is you know, it's, it's a good color? What's the feel? Whenever we buy something, we always think about the materials of that product and uh, we select the products based on the materials and we also consider about whether it's expensive, whether it's going to be waterproof, does it have good insulation, is heat resistant and so on. So these are the general interests from anybody in any material. But from a structural point of view or structural engineer's point of view, we would also like to know how strong the material is, how stiff it is, how durable it is how heavy it is, how efficient it is. These are the terms which we must define before we can answer because strength needs to have some numbers on it and stiffness has to have some definition on it, durability and so on. So let's try to see if we can answer some of these, these questions that are raised. Now, how do we answer these questions? And these questions can be, can be answered through looking at the material properties. Let's see what material properties are of our interest when we want to understand the materials. First of all, the physical information as I mentioned, color, texture, cost, and so on. Then we have to look at the materials for analysis, uh, which may include the elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, uh, shear modulus, density, damping, conductivity, and so on. So there are many properties that we are interested in uh, when we are thinking about the analysis, structural analysis. And there are some properties which are, which are specific to design, for example, yielding stress, and ultimate strength, uh, creep, shrinkage, specific strength and durability. A combination of all will define the, the material. These properties will be then used to understand the material and then use it to create members and finally structures. This is one of the basic material law that we have all learned, which is the, the, the Hooke's law, in which we think that the stress and strain are related by, an, by a constant num number, which is the uh, elastic modulus. This elastic modulus is normally taken as a constant value, but we will, so we, we will soon discuss that this is not the case, because this is 
this constant is only available uh, for materials that are behaving in linear elastic manner, which means they have not changed to a nonlinear response yet. And this is only valid for very limited cases. And, the, and, and we also need to realize that this is only corresponding to one of the stress resultants. Actually, there are so many stress and strain components in, a, in, a, in any, any material, and this pertains to one of them, and those stress components may or may not be interdependent on each other. If you look at the full elastic stiffness model of any, any material, we will see that there are three axial strains or axial stresses and three shear stresses and shear strains. So basically, we are dealing with a full matrix of six by six, um, in terms of the six strains and six stresses, and then there will be 36 possible uh, relationship with them. And those relationships, some are valid, some are invalid, which is zero, and then they are also represented by the Poisson's ratio, uh, and which then, they, which means that these, some of the strains are dependent on other components and they are not independent, so the Poisson's ratio will come in into in those ones. So based on this full the stress strain model, we can see that any single modulus uh, will not actually be sufficient uh, for understanding the material in, in different direction and that's why we may have shear modulus and we may have elastic modulus and so on. The question is why material behavior is so important, uh, especially from structural engineer's point of view. And as I mentioned earlier, that this basically is used to understand the entire structural response because any structure is subjected to excitation, loads, vibration, settlement, thermal changes, and so on, and it will produce a response in terms of displacement, strain, stresses, and stress resultant. And this uh, response can be determined by using a traditional uh, or a simplified uh, or a basic stiffness relationship in which the displacement or the response is linked to the force or the excitation through the stif stiffness or the spring constant. So we can conceive the structure as a large, stiff, large, big spring. And if you look at now this, then the most important parameter here, or unknown here, is the stiffness. Now if you look at the stiffness, stiffness is built just like this, the structure. So we have the material stiffness, we have cross-section stiffness, we have member stiffness, we have structure stiffness, and they are built in step by step. So material stiffness is taken, and then the cross-section geometry is added, and that becomes section stiffness, and then section stiffness is taken, the member geometry is added, and it becomes member stiffness, and after that, the structure geometry is added, and it becomes the whole structural stiffness, which is normally represented by a matrix, and this is also represented as a matrix. These, these could be individual values in each direction. So we can see clearly that the analysis, structural analysis would not take place unless we define material stiffness or material properties properly. And this is true for both the, the design or design approaches, the, the traditional one in which we start from the applied loads and we at, end up with the material stresses and strains and the performance-based design or a capacity-based design where we'll start from the material response and we end up with the load capacity. In both cases, material understanding is the key, one at the end and one at the beginning of the process. And this is also true when we look at the entire uh, analysis cycle, analysis design cycle, where we start from the loads, go to actions, compute deformations, compute strains, then stresses, and stress resultants, and back check the factor of safety. And again, material properties will play a very important role. Let's now look at what kind of relationship exists between stress and strain, because we, uh, based on the Hooke's law, it seems to be a very simple constant relationship that links stress and the strain. And let's see how we can analyze that particular relation in a little bit more detail. So let's see how the material might behave. It might behave as a linear elastic material or response between stress and strain are linked linearly and also they are elastic. That means if you unload, it will come back to the same place and it is going in infinite uh, stress and strain are possible. This is what the Hooke's law basically will state. Then the material could be linear and inelastic. That means it may form linear, it may behave linearly 
the relationship between stress and strain is linear, but it may not come back to the original point where we started when we unload it. So there is a, there is a damage in the material which is then retained. And then there, it could be nonlinear elastic, which means the behavior response, the relationship is nonlinear, but still elastic. So it still come back, comes back even though it may not be linear. And there could be a failure point in this one. And there could also be a point of no return in certain materials where it cannot come back after that. And then we have the nonlinear inelastic, which is the, the, the most complete response in which the uh, relationship is nonlinear as well as it does not come back. And the loading and unloading follow a different path. And this leads to the hysteresis of the materials, which we will also briefly touch upon. Now, how it might fail? So the material might fail uh, as, as this, the ideal, idealized elastic, perfect plastic. That means it remains linear and at some point becomes completely uh, perfectly plastic and it continues forever. So this is a bilinear representation of the material, which is most common for steel and metallic, metallic uh, and metals. And there could be elastoplastic where it goes up and it yields, but it yields, yields gradually and it also may have some strain hardening and so on. And this is some of the materials will behave in this way. And some materials could be termed as ductile, that means they, they continue to deform a lot before reaching their fracture point. And some may be brittle, that means after they reach the, the maximum limit, they, they, they fail or break or drop in, in, in the stress capacity very quickly. All of the previous response that we have seen can actually be represented by a, a generalized stress strain curve. And as you can see, this curve may have a linear part, may have a yield portion, may have a softening part, may have a hardening part, and may have a fracture point. So this generalized stress strain curve actually contains all of the, the material, basic material types that we just discussed which are the one that I just showed you. And it also may contain the second part, which is the uh, unloading and the, 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 the damage. But that part is actually represented by a different curve, which we can then combine with the generalized representation and then complete the response of a material. And, and this part is the, the hysteresis. So you can see here, that the complete story of a material or complete uh, properties of the material are represented by a combination of a stresses loop and a backbone curve. So backbone curve shown here in dark green here, this is the one that you can say that if it, the material was to be loaded in one direction only and not unloaded, you will get probably like something like this. And if the material was loaded, unloaded and continue to do that, we will get another curve, a backbone curve, which may not match with this screen and may be lower than that, which may include damage. So this, these two curves combine the backbone curve and the hysteresis uh, curve or hysteresis loops combine, give us the complete uh, information about the material for analysis and design. And we could, we normally use this in in nonlinear analysis and in capacity-based design, as well as in dynamics analysis and so on. So we will discuss those parts in the next parts of the, this, this discussion. We can see now that almost all materials are actually nonlinear, especially reinforced concrete. So the material stiffness is nonlinear, the cross-section stiffness is nonlinear, member stiffness is nonlinear, and, and as a consequence, structural stiffness is nonlinear. That means the structural response will be nonlinear, as well as most likely inelastic. Unfortunately, that is not the end of the story because this stress strain curve that we just saw and the stresses loop that we just saw, in fact, depends on so many factors. There is no unique stress strain curve for material. This will be modified by so many things. For example, the basic material composition, the in initial uh, uh, conditions where we started from, the state of the strain, the current level of strain, the direction of strain, the history of strain, the time since the strain was started, and then the temperature at which the, uh, the material is currently operating or currently being used, or the temperature it has been used in the past, and then cyclic strain, how many cycles of loading and unloading have, uh, have gone through, the rate of change of strain, how fast we load something, how 
of what is the velocity, what is the acceleration of the loading and unloading, and and and, and so, so as you can see, the material response actually will be modified by so many other factors. Even if we were to have a stress strain curve, basic stress strain curve from the testing of the material in the lab, it needs to be adjusted by so many other factors. Then we also can talk about material efficiency. That means uh, how can we use the least amount of material uh, or the least cost of the material and how can we say which material is more efficient than the other, how can we define efficiency of the material and uh, we also have to look at the cost to benefit, benefit to cost ratio. Obviously we need a material which has a high benefit to cost ratio because cost is, is, is critical in most of the, the construction projects where we use the material. And the last concept in this list is the concept of specific strength, which basically tells us how much capacity the material has to carry loads and not just carry itself because of its own uh, weight or density. And this, may, this is actually a measure of its, its efficiency as well. And we will discuss this in more detail in the next discussion. Together with the uh, specific strength, we will also look at the comparison of properties of some interesting materials. We will look at the factors that affect the strain in materials. We will look at the factors that affect the stress in the materials. And we will look at the overall stress strain response modified by, by, by these. So these will be the topics for this next discussion. I, I hope you found this discussion in, 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 you know, valuable and interesting. And we will continue uh, discussing about the materials in three more videos after that. Thank you.